I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy most of the time. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and let me introduce you to my brotherhood of cinema here. First up, we've got James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Dude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by hashtag me too. I was kissed by Patrick Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> and groped by George Takai. <laughs> Next up is Cody Klusner. I was the one who held the camera. I filmed the whole thing. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yes, this episode we are extending Halloween. Uh, we are going to uh, talk and make tribute to the late, great uh, Toby Hooper, who passed away in August of this year. So it's time to pay tribute to the Grandmaster Director. Uh, so this we're going to talk about a few films here of his work, not all of his. Uh, so let's start off with probably one of the most early, most notable works of Toby is uh, Texas Chainsaw. Mm-hmm. So James, uh, tell me, tell us more about Texas Chainsaw. Uh, you're not even calling it by its full name now, Te- are you? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Do you want me to say massacre? Massacre? Yes. Massacre? Yes, ma- yes massacre, because Texas Chainsaw is one of the newest installments that freaking sucks trying to tell other faces backstory. Aha! Uh-huh. Yeah, there were... We'll... we'll go into that i guess um but uh yes texas chainsaw massacre a low budget grindhouse style uh production uh, made and released in 1974 was uh i believe it was uh toby hooper's first uh first movie it was Mm -hmm. Made on an astonishingly uh, low budget. I'm looking at, well, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at three hundred thousand dollars in terms of the production, which probably wasn't even used to pay the actors. Uh, it's probably it, probably most of that was just uh, used to procure the film and the crew. But yes, this is. This is a movie that shows what you can, uh, what you can do, if you if you just have the right resources, and uh, and uh, the right a right easy enough kind of story. A lot of a lot of um, a lot of movie companies out there have uh, have the ability to say that yeah they started off. They start off making cheesy horror movies because uh, it's there's something about fear or the or the um, desire for fear in this case um, that uh, that draws audiences and with cases like this they like horror movies because they're a nice cheap way to bring butts in the seats. Uh, this uh, that was the case for early New Line Cinema. Which um, I I believe I believe they were the ones that made this. Uh, uh, or am I mixing that up with the? Uh... No no no. Uh, this film was the production company was Vortex and it was distributed by Bryanston Pictures, which was just a cover for the mob. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Bryanston Pictures, because I saw a documentary about. Text change. So this uh, distributed company that they used was worked for the mob. It was a cover for the mob, which is why Toby Hooper and a majority of the crew members never saw any money from this movie. What? Yeah. Son of a bitch. Yeah. What? How? Okay. 
Well, when the head guy is called Anthony Big Tony uh, uh, Pranio or whatever, that's kind of a clue. But yeah, a hand to God, not a word of a lie. This movie was distributed by a distributed company run by the mob because no major company would touch it. They thought it was too much. And yet somehow it became a hit. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, the, uh... So, yeah, like I said, um... Uh, made on, made on a very, very much of a shoestring budget. Uh, I guess Toby Hooper, uh... I must have had stories to... Must have, uh, had stories to share with George Romero in terms of, uh, changing... Changing movie history and getting shit all for it. But anyway... Um, yeah, the, we have a, we have a story where a uh, bunch of hippies in a, in an RV are going, are going through, uh, going through Texas. They, uh, they end up, uh, wrecking the car in, uh, in, uh, this one place out in, out in the open and, uh, they start getting chased down by... Uh, they start getting jazzed down by a guy who wears flesh on his on his face and waves around a chainsaw. Not all of the time, mind you, just some of the time. Other times he'll uh, bash their head in with a skull, with bash their head in with a a hammer or something like that. And um, yeah, this is uh, it's it's an effective. It's an effective slasher piece because it's not it's not as gory it's actually not as gory as some as some people remember. And yes, there's there are gory moments in there. A guy a guy in a wheelchair gets sawn in half. Which technically you don't really see. You just see him from behind as Leatherface is just poking at it looking with a chainsaw. You don't actually see any of the gory bits when the girl gets hung on the meat hook when other face is carving a guy. You don't see it. You just hear the effects. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the clever part of this movie. Well, less is more in some cases. Mm -hmm. Well, you you saw the blood. You oh, saw yeah. the blood when when uh, when the guy was getting the chainsaw. But um, uh, yeah, outside of that, I think what what makes this movie work for me is watching it under the right conditions. Also. I I remember seeing this movie once in in the hottest room in my house in the middle of the summer. Yes, in the pretty much the attic. Uh, I used to well over ten years ago when I was in college. Uh, we uh, before we remodeled the house, we had a uh, we had an office space on the opposite end of where I'm of where I am right now we called it we called it the cave but it's really no it was really just uh uh just the sort of the bare bones interior of the house we didn't even we didn't even have walls in there it was just uh it was just me and my uh me and my dad's computer and the other computers and there was a nice little couch where we could lay back in so uh, that room got that that room got hot. Not gonna lie. And so if you watch this movie when you're sitting on on the couch in the hottest room in your house in the middle of the summer, you start feeling you start you're you're engrossed in the film because that's the exact type of atmosphere that is captured on film. In this movie, it is it is dirty, it is hot, it is muggy, and that's what they had to put up with during the production. And it it shows you can you can you can practically smell the the Texas coming off the screen <laughs> when you watch this movie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so yeah, for for something that was 
uh, that was very shoestring. I felt like it was. I felt like it was very effective. Uh, you seem to know a little uh, thing or two about this, Cody. Uh, uh yes. Because I watched uh, David Rose's DVD shelf reviews when he reviewed most of the Texas Chainsaw movies. But I yeah, it, yeah. But pretty much what when James was explaining about the atmosphere of the movie and what the people have to work with. That's pretty much how it really was. This is back when people were willing to suffer for their artwork. Oh yeah, this is they they ran out of they ran out of blood for the production, so they actually had to cut an actress's finger in order to get it to bleed. <laughs> and I, I she must be like, okay, I'm doing this to get famous. I'm doing this to get famous. Just cut it. Just do it. Feed After me, Seymour. Nobody ever knows who you are. <laughs> yeah. You're just, that, you're just that crazy lady who screams a lot, covered in blood. Carrie? No, no, the other one. Mm. But, yeah, and Toby Hooper did actually come back years later to do a sequel. Texas uh, Chainsaw yes. Massacre Part 2. Yes. The one, the one enjoyable sequel with Dennis Hopper. <laughs> I am the god of the harvest. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they with the with part two he had that uh, that was a canon film I think also. Yep. Yeah, he was uh, he had a lot more money to work with here, and um, and that's that's one nice thing about it is that at, by this point in his career he was an established Hollywood director. Uh, just revisiting just. Just revisiting uh, the movie that uh, that uh, that made it all happen for him, and uh, not only do you have named stars, but also some pretty decent uh, some some pretty decent set design here too. Oh. I mean, uh, Leather Leatherface is really the only is really the only. Uh, uh, connection between the two films, but uh, somehow he's got a new family and whatnot. Uh, not really. There was actually uh, Jim Sydow. He was also in the first movie. He was the cook, and he's the cook in this movie. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Mm. Just a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, but he's got a new brother. Oh yeah. A guy Wait. who's. Uh, a metal plate in his head. A guy, a guy who's uh, scratching himself with a with a coat hanger. <laughs> Bub's got a girlfriend. Bub's got a girlfriend. There seems to be an arc. There seems to be an archetype to the type, uh, the, 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 to, to, to the the villain characters, as as it were, that show up in these movies. There's always one that acts. Uh, that acts crazy and over the top and the first movie was the hitchhiker and in the second movie it's chop top <laughs> which if i remember correctly there was a one line like a brief line in the movie the reason he wasn't in the first movie is because he was off in vietnam that's how he got the plate in his head which time ah. makes, makes sense ah so he just sort of uh came back and said i'll replace I'll I'll replace uh I'll I'll replace the the other the other crazy personage. Mm-hmm. Pretty okay. much. Um and yeah, this movie is this movie is still uh, going over the top. I think I think with uh, with this one and in terms of how it was written, especially with Dennis Hopper's performance and lines as you've so uh, so mentioned, they were trying to. It feels like they were trying to make this one a little bit more campy. I do have a clip from the Electric Boogaloo uh, documentary. If you want to give it a listen for insight on, just a reminder about the mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. Excited about Toby was Texas Chainsaw, which was really kind of a raw experience. Chainsaw wasn't just a horror film; it had a lot of reflection of society. It totally changed the genre of horror. 
Cannon wanted Toby to do a sequel to Chainsaw. They wanted it desperately. Now, after more than a decade of silence, the buzz is back. I amplified the dark humor. I felt that that was missed in the first film. Bubba's got a girlfriend. 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 Some people have been calling it red humor. Because it also made up for the lack of gore in Chainsaw One. So they show it. First time Cannon seen it. Boys, boys, boys. It was not what they expected. For some reason, Cannon didn't realize it was a comedy. Small businessman. Always, always, always gets it in the ass. Menachem and Yoram are not very flexible, and if you sell them a horror picture, they want horror. It was a shocker for them to not know what the film was. We took the Chainsaw family and copied the same poster from The Breakfast Club, and it went up on Sunset Boulevard. And Cannon didn't know it was a comedy? The audience wasn't prepared for the craziness or the looniness that Chainsaw 2 They just wanted to scream. And Toby didn't want to make another screaming movie. The end of Chainsaw was almost really the public beginning of the end for Cannon. In October. Yeah, so. Mm hmm. But yeah, that's, uh. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's kind of it in a nutshell. That is. It's. it's yeah. they, he made a comedy out of it. He. Gore, brought in a lot of more gore and dark humor to it that he didn't do for the first movie that he wanted to do, I guess. So. Well, I think he didn't get a lot of gore in the first movie because of the censors at the time. Right. But yeah, but. The, the, yeah, they just weren't expecting it to be a comedy, which is weird. It's like, dude, you, marketing was freaking copying the Breakfast Club poster for crying out loud. <laughs> it's like, uh, hello... Uh, so yeah so that's and that would be the and that would be the last time uh, that would be uh, the the last film in the in this particular uh, piece of the of uh, the the Texas Chainsaw Texas, Texas Chainsaw Saga that I'd actually I've actually seen. I have not seen the third film. Uh, I want to avoid the fourth film, even even though I hear uh, Matthew McConaughey is hilarious. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, and, then, and then the fifth one was the Chainsaw Massacre remake, I believe, uh, produced by Michael Bay. Which I have seen, and I thought it was... It's all right. It's a decent... It. It's all right. It, so, it's it's its own thing. It's decent. Yep. Yeah, so then the next three movies uh, in this franchise, uh, The Chainsaw Massacre of the Beginning, which is was co-produced a by Toby. To the, it's a prequel to the uh, the Michael Bay remake. Yep, exactly. But here but here's the here's the thing about the two recent movies that came out, uh, for the oh, in the right. franchise. So you have Tanks Texas uh, Chainsaw 3D, which is a direct sequel to the 74 movie. And like, time wise, it makes not one goddamn sense. But it, why not? They've got a they've got a trailer where where uh, they're sticking a chainsaw on somebody's arm and a chainsaw pokes out into the screen because it's 3D. It is as a 3D movie, but yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking. I'm talking about. Yes, like he said, that movie is a direct se It's supposed to be a direct sequel for the movie because the first movie takes up with the police coming into the Sawyer house, which I have to admit, the beginning of this movie is the only good part because you see the original Sawyer house, you know, and all that action. That was awesome. But, he has the thing. The first movie takes place in 1974 where the sequel picks up. Where our main character comes in isn't until around... When did this? When did that movie come out? Two thousand. Hold on, I'm trying to. Two thousand thirteen. Something like that, and they're. I need to remind you, the main character of this movie 
was a baby in the beginning of the movie in 1970. She's in her 20s in 2013. And they don't even try to hide it because they all have smartphones on screen. I'm like, what? What? Is she Lazarus? Did she find the fountain of youth somewhere? This doesn't make sense. So she would be 30 something. Uh, yeah. 30, oh, it's been 40. It. She, she's in her early 20s. Okay, seven, okay 74. Late, le, no, wait, late 20s. Uh, yeah. 74, 84, 94. 2004. 2000. 2004. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it, it would be 39. And she looks, and she looks like she's 21. And the real sad part of this movie is they actually did get some of the main characters from the first movie to play cameos. And I was like, yeah. that's nice, but this movie sucks. And recently, this year, Leatherface came out. And it's a prequel to the original movie. So you have Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Texas Chainsaw 3D. That's your new trilogy of movies. What's... Are we... Making any gosh darn sense here? Uh, oh, no, no. Just get Leatherface with a big chainsaw. We make money. Yeah. Uh, I, oh. I see we've got uh, Bill Mosley uh, with a with a cameo on this one. Okay. Uh, oh. Chop top. <laughs> but yeah, I I don't I'm I just. I just don't know if these are worth if these are worth touching for whatever reason because I'm I'm not um I'm not necessarily going by by ratings I'm not right. going by what uh I'm not uh, going by what other people are saying about it you just you just have a you just sort of have a, a sense going in and looking at this and saying and seeing a trailer and and saying to yourself, what what's the what's the reason behind this? And so I haven't seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning. I haven't seen Texas Chainsaw 3D. I have not seen Leatherface. I didn't even know that there was a new one. Yep, came this out this is year. Like the the. Uh, this whole saga is as chrono chronologically confused as as uh, as the, the Legend Halloween of Zelda films. <laughs> I, I was gonna say the Halloween films. You know, you got oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got okay. So the first two movies happened. Third movie is its own thing. Then we got the Thorn trilogy. Jamie Lee Curtis is dead. Voila. Jamie Lee Curtis is alive, living elsewhere. The second movie didn't happen either. The four, fourth, fifth, and sixth movies didn't happen. Follows follows that up with Resurrection. Then we reboot it with Re Rob Zombie, and now we're doing a sequel again with Jamie Lee Curtis alive. Because again, none of the other movies ever happened. Uh, yeah. No. What and <laughs> it's. Yes. But the sad uh, thing is, a couple of other horror movies are actually doing something similar to Leatherface. Uh, more importantly, the two newest uh, Chucky movies, which I kind of enjoyed. I like where they're going with it. And then you have, like I said, Jeepers yeah. Creepers 3, which takes place directly after the first one and then leads into the second one. The first what? movie was dumb to begin with in my book. I thought the first one was all right, you know, interesting concept, interesting monster. Second one, no. And where was the demand for a third one? No one know. ever talks about these movies anymore. Well, I will say this: it played in the played in selective theaters for one day in September. And that's all you get, one day. So, uh, yeah, Ugh. it, it, it gets, 
it gets to over the it gets to cluttered and over the top when there's too many heads involved when they all say at once hey there's still there's still there's still money in this but let's let's just try to do something so no um stick with the original texas chainsaw massacre and if you really if you really like that one it's sequel uh the first well just number two part two also the other toby hooper movie the other toby hooper movie it's his it's his franchise he gave birth to it it's his baby he knows how to treat it then he left it in a cardboard box on the side of the road to be picked up by anyone Mm -hmm. (sighs) that's all i really gotta say yes and uh Let's talk about the next one that comes after Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which would have been 82's Poltergeist. Yeah. Remember how I said that by this, uh, by the time he made the second Chainsaw movie, he was an established Hollywood director? Mm-hmm. Yeah, continue, Cody. <laughs> yeah, so I think we should address the elephant in the room when it comes to uh, Poltergeist. Now... Screen. Now, it was actually written by Steven Spielberg, who at the time when they were directing this movie, he was, I honestly swear to God, two streets over directing E.T., because you look at both movies, they're obviously filmed in the same neighborhood. Now, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of behind the camera and cast say that even though he couldn't direct it because it was his contract, he couldn't direct two movies at once, that he actually did have a lot of hand-on and on, you know, strength with all the characters and cast when it came to filming. So, a lot of people are asking ourselves, is, was this movie directed by Steven Spielberg or Toby Hooper? And if you look at it, yeah, it kind of does look like a Spielberg film, but it says, Toby Hooper, on the, it says Toby Hooper on the side of the tin, so, yeah. So It's got his fingerprints on it. There, yeah. Okay, it's so... Good. This, I knew this was going to be brought up because there was an interview with the director of photography of the original film, and then somebody brought this question up who directed the movie. The director of photography of the original movie said that Steven Spielberg directed the movie. Well, well yeah, well, I don't care. Toby Hooper, it says so right there. I'm looking at it right now. Toby Hooper, Wikipedia, he directed it. Oh, that that would make a lot of sense because so many uh, so many uh, so many parts of this movie uh, do uh, they do feel a little bit more on the the magical whimsical side than your than your typical uh, Toby Hooper flick. Yeah, even the music, even though it wasn't John Williams, it was uh, Jerry Goldsmith. That even sounds like you know. Something that John Williams would cook up for Spielberg. Mm-hmm. They have a they have a special effects sequence where, where there's a a, a a flying spinning top coming out of a out of a closet, <laughs> which is just kind of it. It looks it looks so pretty. It looks like it, the, this movie should have been a three D movie. That would have been. No, no, no. no I'm sorry, so? no. Not in the eighties, not with the whole red and blue three D glasses thing. I I can't stand three D on general. It gives me a headache. So here, I wanna actually show this to you guys. Here's a picture from the set. Um mm-hmm. Toby Hooper's there in the beard, and that's Steven Spielberg pointing, mm-hmm. directing. And this mm-hmm. is this is the scene where the tree grabs the kid. Mm-hmm. So there's just more proof that I just wanna point out there for people that don't they gave credit to Toby Hooper, even though Spielberg was there on the set directing. He just got credit. So, well, that's kind of that. That that really feels odd. Uh, I... Let's see here. What's to say here? Uh, it was both fun and intense. Spielberg, after work, was the nicest guy on the planet. You got to his house. Billy Hills watched daily is on the set. He was very intense. Hooper was so nice and just happy to be there. He, he creatively had input. Uh, Steven developed the movie, and it was his to direct, except there is a 
anticipation of a director strike, so he was the producer, but really he directed it in case there was going to be a strike, and Toby was cool with that. It wasn't anything against Toby. Every once in a while, he would actually leave the set and let Toby do a few things just because, but really, Steven directed it. Mm-hmm. So does this even qualify for this podcast now is the question. That That's... Uh, so, uh, so he... Uh, uh, look at... I, I, I'm sorry, I'll just take this to the day I die. Wikipedia! If you got a copy of the movie, look on the back. Directed by Toby Hooper. So, okay. So, okay, so we're still sticking with it because he... It has some things related to Toby Hooper because he directed a few mm-hmm. things within it and it does feel like a Steven Spielberg thing but it's like a co-production between Hooper and Spielberg so yeah. it's fine I'm allowing there's it some, so yeah, there's some Hooperisms in there you know uh, one one classic Hooperism is uh, is using actual skeletons in uh, in uh, yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre he used chicken bones because they were cheaper uh, yeah yeah. Uh, but um, uh, but yeah, in this movie there is uh, there's some uh, there's some uh, controversy as to whether or not the uh, the the corpses that come out of the ground with the skeletons inside and you know the coffins that pop out and the skeletons that pop out whether or not the skeletons are real. Uh, I I'm willing to believe that yes, the skeletons are real. They just made them up a bit. You're willing to go with that? Well, there's real skulls on the right of the Pirates of the Caribbean in Disney World. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one down in Florida. Uh, yeah. Go on to the right. You know, have that skull and crossbones overhead, saying, "Yo, know, uh, weary tall hunter, dead men no tell." That's a real skull. I kid you not, that's a real skull. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah, please do. Okay. Now, one thing I found interesting as I think about this movie is that, as I said, uh, Spielberg was also directing E.T. at the time of this movie. Um, this this movie and E.T. were actually a split-up of one main story that Spielberg wanted to, talk, wanted to tell about aliens who come down from space and terrorize these people in their secluded house, which actually, well, we might be talking about something similar to that later on tonight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, apart from being a great story about a family being terrorized by ghosts or poltergeists in this movie, it actually isn't that bad. You got some great acting, a great cast, mm-hmm. to say the least. Mm-hmm. Uh, Greg Kig Nelson before his coach years. Yep. He actually could pull off drama before a comedy. Oh, yeah. Oh, really good. And then, of course, you have the precious Heather O'Rourke, who was just creepy by default, you know, at some points, you know? Unlike mm-hmm. the remake, where they said, be more cute. Be more cute. Like, you don't need to dial up the cute on a little girl. They're cute by default. I forgot there was a remake. Oh. Yeah, that, I didn't. I avoided that with the plague. I mean, uh, Sam Rockwell as Craig T. Nelson's de- father character. I mean, didn't even have. Uh, oh, the 2015. Yeah, it was two years ago. Yeah, why would you want to remake this movie? Everyone knows that the Poltergeist curse needs to stay low. Exactly. Uh, speaking of that, does anyone in this podcast believe in the Poltergeist curse? I believe it in about, I believe in it uh, about as much as I believe in the SNL curse, and and by that I mean, shit happens. Yeah, yeah, it's just a coincidence. Uh, it's a it's a nasty, nasty coincidence that that these deaths were all. Uh, connected to the same uh, to the same series of productions um, but yeah uh, oh, oh, oh. oh god did you like know one of the producers of the Poltergeist remake Sam Raimi 
Uh. Oh, phew, I thought you were going to say Harvey Weinstein. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, yes, you're right. That was, yeah, Sam Raimi did produce that one, I remember now, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, like, I got, look, give me the money for Ash vs. Evil Dead. I just got to do it. Grit my teeth and do it. <laughs> Um, by the way, yes, the skeletons are real. Yes, I just, I've been snoping everything as we... Okay, good. I was as just, we've been I, checking I, it. I wanted to, like, say it for the viewers at home. They, they were real. They're cheaper to purchase than the plastic ones. Wow. Yeah. And we sell those at the, at work, too. But they probably aren't, no. are, they probably not cheap, though. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, I've seen the first. I've seen the fol- first Poltergeist. Second one, I. Second one. Uh, I I saw the television version. Uh, God is in his holy temple. That I, I, I'm I'm only gonna say it. Poltergeist two was an awesome sequel. It's just a shame though. Uh, this is one thing I don't understand about Poltergeist two. As we all know, one of the characters in the first one, uh, she played the older sister of Carol Ann. After the movie was done, she was brutally murdered by her boyfriend, stabbed to death. Now, here's something I don't understand. In the sequel, there's a deleted scene where they say that she went off to college, but for some reason, that was cut. And we get no explanation why her character's not there. She just vanished. I mean, I shouldn't, we shouldn't even, like, mention the sequels because I have no relation to Toby Hooper whatsoever. I mean But to... we talked about but we talked about the Texas Chainsaw sequels that that But Toby yeah. Hooper at least co produced most of them. Mm-hmm. So I don't think let me double check here and see if he actually produced Nope. Didn't direct two didn't produce two. Uh and three. I don't think he produced as well. I doubt it. No. Nope. I, I... So I, it's not even, I mean, but that's the thing though. It's like, how would you, that's the thing. These other directors are taking the direction of Toby Hooper's baby, basically, or Spielberg's Spielberg, <laughs> Spielberg Hooper's baby, I guess. Spielberg uh, Hooper. Spielberg Hooper. <laughs> Steven, yeah, but, Steven Hooper. Oh well, yeah. Well, when it comes to horror films, you gotta be prepared for other directors. I mean, there are, there are some Halloween sequels canon if not that right. i actually enjoyed that weren't directed by john carpenter right exactly so mm-hmm. um, just point that out there so i mean you guys can continue with that it's, it's fine well i will i will say something about three it had an interesting concept with the whole mirrors thing that was an interesting concept but everything else falls flat never saw the third one so I, I i wouldn't waste time on it uh well i mean I mean, other than the fact that the actress who played Carol Ann tragically died before filming was done, and they had to use her stunt double to finish the movie. Yeah. Mm. There is a uh, upcoming documentary called The Curse of Poltergeist. Ooh. It'll focus on the life and experiences of actor Oliver Robbins, who played Robbie Feeling in the first and second installment of the franchise, as a way to explore the tragedies that had befallen those involved with the films. So that's com- that should be coming out pretty soon if you guys are interested in you know, what's going on behind the scenes of that. But yeah, uh, I isn't that like that uh, Amityville horror movie? Uh, not film, but documentary where they took one of the little boys who actually experienced it and tried to, you know, retrace his steps. Basically saying, "I'm doing this for the money. That's all. I'm doing it for the money." Oh, uh, could be. Yeah, but still sounds like fun. Yeah more uh, information uh but yeah poltergeist i freaking like love it like to oh. bits it, <laughs> it, it it is like the ultimate like one of the greatest 80s movies out there like it has all the references you need like to george lucas and spielberg of course you could get the star wars stuff in the background the kids room it's like oh come on who kid has all this come on i want that <laughs> <laughs> and then like uh man uh but the story's good oh my god like the effects are decent enough for the 80s at the time early 80s i mean oh uh, oh oh uh, 
more than decent. My friend, they were spectacular. I mean, the kid was actually getting strangled by the clown in the movie. He was at, he was in real life. I wasn't talking about the clown or the tree. I'm talking about, like, the, like, ghost kind of effects and the beast that comes out of the closet. That was kind of, it it was okay looking at most. It's it's just. And And I will say this. One of the better ghost movie, ghost story movies. Yes. Oh yeah. See a lot of these oh days. yeah. Oh yeah. Except like, for, except for Crimson Peak, that was a that was a highlight. <clears throat> huh. But yeah, that's, yeah, Poltergeist is one of those ghost movies that are really generally good. I mean, in in the whole genre of ghost films, like, there probably is among other ghost films that we're not probably gonna mention we have seen, but like Poltergeist is up there. Like, not nothing can top it. You know. Um, they're here. I mean, for crying out loud, it's in, it's in our intro for crying out loud. I, I use a clip for, from the movie in our intro, so it, it's because mm-hmm. I I love it so much. I had to like create that for the podcast. So it's like they're here. It's 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 iconic for a reason. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, give it a watch. Just don't uh... just. If you enjoy the first one, you might enjoy the sequel. You won't. You might get some mild entertainment out of the third one. And for the love of God, if you see a copy of the remake, burn it. I mean, seriously. The remake. Their TV gets snow. How in the hell does that work in this day and age? I mean, who even watches TV? Yeah, weird. I can only look some. Da, da, da. Oh, not not much to it. Thirty one percent Rotten Tomatoes. Yay! Pull the guys. You suck. The the remake. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh. So yes. And then we come to towards you know, Pull the guys got him a lot of fame, especially Chainsaw, T- Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That led to uh Toby Hooper going to Canon. He did Life Force. We talked about that in our warm-up of course like i said check out the canon film episode if you want more information about life force um but then 86 comes around he released uh texas chainsaw massacre 2 the same year um but he also directed a movie called invaders from mars which is a remake it is a remake so here's let me give you a point of reference and clarification I've only seen the remake. I have not seen the original, so I don't have no context of comparing between the two movies. I will probably watch the original at some point to compare with the remake, but um, they actually do mention about Invaders from Mars in the documentary Electric Boogaloo, the story of canon, which I'll play a little bit later. But let me get into the basic gist. And when I was watching it, I thought there was a sim- similar story that it seems so familiar to me. I'm like, uh, what? a kid is the only one that knows that there's a, a Martian invasion going on. <laughs> yeah. But then of course the quote invasion of Mars, the Martians, uh, they're taking over people trying to, I'm insinuating that the movie is kind of like invasion of body snatchers. In a way, mm-hmm. it, I was watching it and I was noticing like little details like that the Martians are taking over, you know, and they're like replacing people with their own kind, I guess. That was it was kind of interesting how they they have like a, a wound on the back of their neck. It's like controlled by the Martian. There's like a a, a brain, a, a Martian brain that that was the head of the whole clan of the martians that was controlling all these humans <laughs> and so my and it's interesting because stan winston did the creature effects for this movie and that's mm-hmm. and it looks really good i mean for what it is i mean the blur the brain looks actually really cool the, oh, dr- yeah. the martian drones yeah. that go around are really ridiculous because they're like a huge like blob and they have like little arms and there's like one with a huge like eye laser going over here oh it's <laughs> It's so interesting, and it's it's also the same year because uh, Stan Winston was doing double work because he was doing that and Aliens at the same time. 
Yes, I will say this. <laughs> the head brain of Mars is the best live action version of Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that we've ever seen. Yes! <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you, yes. And that's why this movie works. Um, it's it's a decent movie, I think, because, like I said, I haven't seen the original, so I can't compare, but it does set up a great, like, atmosphere with the kid. The kid is actually pretty good in this. He's a good child actor. He does his role very well as a guy, as a kid who loves space and then discovers the the martians coming in and then you start to notice that the father is a little bit different and he starts to he starts to think wait a minute what's going on here you know dad what's what's the matter with you and they see the back of the neck and it's like ooh, and it keeps continuing on and on through the whole movie where people are going to this the place where the martians landed and they get uh you know replaced you know and the teacher my god the teacher follows the teacher at one point and goes back in the back room and the teacher's eating a frog. <laughs> just eating a frog, just out of... Like you do. It's... Maybe she's French? <laughs> so, because um, his father, David, I believe is the main character's name is David, he works... His father works at NASA. And as you go along, you, you kind of get the hint that the Martians want to destroy something within the NASA base and they put a bomb within a truck and it's stri driving straight towards the uh, missile that goes ready to be launched for NASA and they start going 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 there's a big explosion hitting the, the missile boom they can't loss or it's not a missile it's like a rocket ship or something that goes like splooey but at that point the nurse Bluey. gets splooey uh <laughs> At that point... It explodes into a kablooey. It's an explooey. <laughs> but throughout the film, the, the David goes to the nurse because nur the nurse has not been affected by the Martians yet. And he's like the only... She, she and her... She and him kind of team up to, you know, to get down to the mystery of these Martians. And funny enough, here's a fun fact for you. The, the son, the actor is actually the real son of the actress who plays the nurse. Oh. Mm. So mother and, mother and son acting together on the screen. Um, it's actually really good chemistry, oddly enough, because they are related, you know? I gave birth to you, you're my son. Um, but then they get the army involved, you know, uh, to go in. There's like, there's, there's like this sand area where they get sucked into, you know, Sand little pit, and you know it goes crazy at the end because uh, there's an all-out war between these Martians and these army people. You know they start gunning down the the drones, and then at the end you see them gunning down the uh, the brain. It's like eh, just going crazy with it. But the ending after that, how do I want to say this? Do you want to spoil the ending? I don't want to say it because it is. I could say it's the most cliched ending to do. <laughs> it's one of the most cliched endings that I don't like. But okay, but the, what they do after that cliched ending, it kind of makes it up for it. It's it makes it up for it with another cliche. Yeah. Yeah. So why not it? Yeah, I didn't. I don't want to say what happens at the end, but it just like. But I'm just it's gonna. I'm just gonna say they they ripped the ending right out of the phantasm. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's it's a typical, you know, it's it's got the, it does have like a sort of a '50s feel because the original movie was like in the '50s, so it's it stays, stays in the same kind of realm in the 50s i guess in a way it's not like an 80s movie all the way there's no 80s 80 isms in there it's just like it's set in a neutral kind of town a small town that happens with the, the invasion yeah it's i mean a lot of a lot of what you've mentioned i had to i had to look back up and and refresh my memory about this because uh, the the story and the story and whatnot. I was it was sort of 
bleeding out of my bleeding out of my memory but all i remembered watching this was yes you're right the uh the the set designs and whatnot and the the creature effects were were amazing the actors were very well picked from this but i yeah. couldn't but i couldn't for the life of me and it, maybe it's because it's been a few years i can sure. for the life of me uh point out a single a, a single scene or an element that uh, that really, really worked outside of what's already been mentioned. Right. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a growing kind of mystery. You know, the kid goes in and tries to see what happens. Um, I will, I see if I can set this up. Actually, I think I set it up here, but I need to reset up the clip they talk about in uh, the documentary Electric Boogaloo: The Story of Canon. And while you're doing that, I'll. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, it, I'll so. make a few other mentions here. Apparently, there's a lot of nods to the original film in this movie. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the original aliens from the '56 version shows up as a as a prop in the school basement in one scene. Uh, the actor from the actor who played the kid in the original movie, Jimmy Hunt, is. Uh, is the police chief in this one. Hence the line, I haven't been here since I was a kid. And, uh, and the, this, the name of the school, uh, William Cameron McKenzie. It's, uh, the, oh, the name oh, of the school. Oh, oh, oh. The director of the original film. Oh, well, this is funny. This is funny. I was watching it and, oh, this is great. Cause they're, Okay, they're exploring, like, the, the... I think it's the alien ship, I believe. That's all caverns. It's all red. And there's, like, a scientist, I believe, from the group that goes with... to go under. And the scientist is looking at, like, this kind of smoke coming out of here. And it's like, ooh, this is interesting. It's like, what's this? This is Kubrick Oxide. Kubrick Oxide. <laughs> Kubrick Oxide. I'm thinking, there's a reference to Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Did they I actually have a readout called Kubrick Oxide. It just still it was like the guy knew what it was. It like he knew he was like grabbing the like the, the thing that was coming out of the it was like this is Kubrick Oxide. And actually the funny thing about the movie is that the these Martians uh absorb power from copper. So the kid has a penny collection and it there's foreshadowing because at the beginning this father gives him a mint condition penny to put in his pocket and they're like wait a minute we don't have a penny who has a penny and a kid's like oh, my penny from my from earlier <laughs> and, and there's like actually like a coin slot where you put the penny in for to make the martian because there's like a dead martian and they use it as a laser just like <laughs> start it up and go like an arcade machine yeah I forgot about it. It's it, It's the Martian Penny Arcade. Oh, I want to explain the ship design when it first lands on Earth. How does no one not notice that? Well, of course. <laughs> yeah, that is the that is the quintessential big mistake that these movies make is that apparently NASA doesn't have a clue. But uh, actually, this does raise a very important question. Yeah. Do you guys think inv invaders from Mars need moms? <laughs> not, not if they're going to be using that motion capture shit. No. <laughs> There's a crossover for you. Jesus. Can fiction be written? All right. Give me a second here. Mm-hmm. Parker! Little winner, please. Hey. just woke up to a nightmare in his own backyard but no one will listen and soon no one will be left toby hooper's invaders from mars i wanted to capture or i should say recapture those images that that literally burned holes in my mind and my imagination and dreams when i was a child i like the idea of being uptight and paranoid to the point where finally you're afraid of your parents 
and where there is really no safe place to go. The tone of the film was off. It wasn't as serious as I think it should have been. It seemed a little bit silly. The film missed really connecting with the deep fears people would have and identifying with a child who can no longer trust his parents. Manoch Mignor hated the film. He really felt personally wounded by what Toby had done, that he had basically sold them on his vision and he didn't deliver on it. And I think that really hurt them. So they didn't like the movie. They, but, but, but like, you know, um, I guess Hooper pitched like, it's going to be like this. And it's like, oh, I thought you're going to give us, you know, because it leads into the, the clip about, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how the horror, it was a raw feeling, you know, really raw when it comes to horror. And they wanted horror, you know. And what they have here is kind of, it, well, it, it's it's got it it's got it's uh, what how shall I put this borderline R rated elements in there, but it's not uh, yeah PG probably would go for a PG thirteen rating now if it were made maybe possibly I mean the the. I mean, there's one point in the movie where the Martians uh, eat the uh, the teacher, just by I mean, like, like uh, David goes to like to kill the uh, like punch like punches the freaking brain. He goes up to punch it, and he's like, "Oh, what did he say?" It's like, <laughs> that's exactly what he said. He sneezed. <laughs> he sneezed. There was like and then he... the brain farted, and they were just. Uh... He just, just had this conversation going back, going. Because <laughs> there was a line he said it was like it was like dickhead or something like dickhead punch. It was so there was some like vulgar like language to the most part. So the kid is like very like like that, and then somehow like the drone motion Martian drones like ar, 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 and the and the, the lady goes like inside the mouth of one just being eaten up. Ow, mom, mom, mom. So it was like okay. <laughs> Those Martians are Pac-Man all of a sudden. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's like I said, I have to see the original to compare it, but I think it is like a decent movie. It's it's cheesy, a little campy, I know, but it's still got those elements of, you know, the kid, like, not trusting his parents, you know, because they're Martians, and it's like the boy who cry wolf, kind of, where nobody believes them and stuff for one person, and they go investigate. It's like, you know your typical sci-fi invasion movie mixed with a little bit of mystery and uh, action at the end for sure so and like James said they do have people from the original movie come in as like cameos and references so which is pretty nice so I think with this movie it's Toby Hooper's uh, like passion because, like he said, he had this enframed in his brain since he was a child. So it was a movie they watched as a kid, you know, and he wanted to remake it. So uh, Canon Film gave him the opportunity, and he actually, I actually thought it was decent. It's one of those mm -hmm. un one of those underappreciated uh, Toby Hooper movie, or uh, even underappreciated Canon film, to be honest. Nobody ever talks about it. Yeah. I mean, after all, Crane just wanted the pennies to build a technodrome. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, protect all your pennies. You know, Martians could come and steal your copper. The power of their empire. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Exactly. <laughs> Fucking. It, it kind of reminds me of the. I guess that kind of reminds me of like the aliens from Cowboy and Aliens, where they have to use gold to power things up. Mm. Oh, shit. Yeah. You think, you think if it was copper, they would after people would wake up in New York one day and realize the Statue of Liberty is missing. Well, they would mm -hmm. if it was set in New York. That would have been the big case for the Martian line. Um, nom, 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 power, 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 copper, copper, copper. copper. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you like invasion movies, uh, a little bit of sci-fi action, and uh, want to see a canon film that's probably worth your time, check out Invaders from Mars. Mm-hmm. Waka, 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 waka. 
Uh, any final thoughts on Toby Hooper, the director? Well, let's... Um, it's kind of hard to say now. I'm going to look through the look through the remainder of his career here. I have... Uh, anything. I, I, after what we, we watched, I, I can't really say that I've seen a heck of a lot of his work, but I will say... Oh, James... You know, James, we saw the Fun House. Yeah, yeah, we did see the Fun House, and that was that one was kind of boring. I don't know what it was. I, I can't, it, it had I the can't. designs, it had the look, and everything, but it was kind of um, yeah, it uh, it was it it didn't feel like it was unique in the same sense sense that uh, Texas Chainsaw was. True. Um, um, I'm trying to see. I think he's made two crocodile movies. I mean, he's he directed Eden Alive in '77, and then in 2000 he uh, directed Crocodile. The only thing after the '80s which I saw involving him was uh, the Masters of Horror episode, Dance of the Dead. Which, uh, right. Unfortunately, that series. really for something that brought together a number of different legendary horror directors, Wes Craven, John Carpenter, uh, Coscarelli, uh, even the guy that did um, those really, really freaking loud movies. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it, it that that series brought out the worst in in some of these directors, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. yeah. I mean, you can't even you can't pinpoint anything along the lines of, say, uh, uh, you can't pin you can't pinpoint anything along the lines of say, uh, a, a director trademark. Uh, or or what have you uh, the stories aren't even that good uh, they just uh, they just seem to be pulling these guys together because it's it's a job and that's really sad <laughs> yeah I mean other works that he's worked on he actually which kind of connects to our previous episode we talked about uh, Stephen King mm -hmm. he actually directed the miniseries Sam, uh, Salem's Lot from 79 uh which is based on Stephen king novel so um that's worth noting uh after chainsaw massacre 2 he's he did uh <laughs> spontaneous combustion uh, mm -hmm. uh night terrors he did uh body bags which is a uh, anthology film horror comedy with um, John Carpenter and Larry Sk Skulls so there's a collaboration there uh, another Stephen King story that he adapted is The Mangler uh, The Apartment Complex made for TV movie he actually remade Toolbox Murders uh, the 78 film he remade it in 2004 produced by the same people behind the original and actually, the two most recent, uh, not Monastery, Mort, Mortinary is another one, but Mortuary. This, Mortuary, thank you. But his mo his last project was not even American. It was actually, uh, it was actually set in. It it was interesting. I couldn't even like tell you about it because it's just so out of. It was it was like wow, you actually didn't do an American film. You actually went to a different country to make a film. For his last film. It happens. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, he actually directed the Dancing With Myself music video by Billy Idol. <laughs> he directed one music video. Dancing With Myself. Don't say no to Billy Idol. Dancing With Myself. But, you know, he directed the uh, Tales from the Crypt episode, uh, Dead Weight. Uh, he directed an episode of Freddy's Nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of... Yeah. A lot of stuff like that. Um, 
he's he's a good director to look out for and especially if you're in the horror genre you know he's among the greats of john carpenter and all that stuff so mm -hmm. just ch check his work out pay much respect to the guy and uh until then uh we will until, be until more of his movies become shitty remakes because he's dead now it's open season mm. Mm. right yeah. Still a thing. I was gonna say it depends. It de I highly doubt it. There's not much for him, not much left for Hollywood to grab out of Toby Hooper. They already did Poltergeist. They did, along with the Chainsaw Massacre films. So. Uh, why does? Uh, and why when I look for? Uh, why do I look for the name Toby Hooper, on Netflix? Does the Death Note remake pop up? What? I didn't know. Oh, hell no. There's not probably a glitch like the on Stranger Things if you pick the whole Christmas. What? Uh, I am dumbfounded. Hold on. Hooper. Oh, nothing's popping up on mine actually. It must be a mistake. It's a glitch, I think. This ain't popping up on my end at all. Uh, I got the same thing as well as Electric Boogaloo. Oh, sorry, I can't ask the documentary that's on Netflix, which I played a couple of clips from from you guys, so... There's your poo, people. Take a good look. Mm -hmm. Results what? for Toby Hooper and more fan favorites. Electric Boogaloo. Death Note. And more fan favorites. That's where they're relying on. And more fan favorites. That's a that's a stretch. That is a, fan, yeah, that's a fan favorite, all right. Uh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it would have been interesting if he actually did direct that movie. If he actually had some control, that would have been interesting to see. Yeah, it it might have actually turned out good, outside of uh, outside of Willem Dafoe. <laughs> Yes, he was the only highlight of that movie. I'm just doing the Green Goblin performance all over again for a different role. You like that, Spider-Man? Mm. Yeah, what's the, what's the score when it comes to live-action anime adaptations? Let's see, oh uh, yeah, zero for zero. Oh, yes, what? What? Like what? Wait a minute, Speed Racer was decent. I like yeah. Speed Racer. Uh, yeah, only if you're on heavy medication. And you don't oh, shut you're up. Not and you're not prone to seizures. I'll testify for... Oh, 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 come on. I'll, even, I'll even... testify for Speed Racer. Okay, and I yes. see the anime. Okay, if I, if yeah. I may, even in the motherland of Japan, they made a live-action movie of Attack on Titan, and that sucked. The fans hated it. And it was made by Toho. The people that gave us Godzilla. I'm just saying, like, they shouldn't, like... Say it because I a lot of people love street. Uh, they love Speed Racer. That's that somehow turned out to be a decent, a guilty pleasure. A decent post Matrix uh, Wachowski's film. Yeah, and they were still, you know. But the bad heavily weighed out the one good. And I pers I'm a, I probably will say it at the beginning of the next year. I would probably say that Ghost in the Shell was okay. <laughs> you know what? I still need to see that. Actually, thanks for reminding me. Uh, well, I I weep for the live action series of Sword Art Online, boys and girls. I weep. Hey, they're they're the people are uh the uh the they're planning on producing a live action Cowboy Bebop. They, that's been in production they, since I was in high school. That's been. I remember back when they wanted Keanu Reeves. To that was for the movie. That was for the live action movie. But they actually said, recently they turned into a live action show of Cowboy Bebop. So, oh, oh. but it's produced by the same company that did the anime as well. So it's in good hands. Maybe, mm. maybe, we'll see. I'll be watching you very closely, very closely. But in my opinion. Uh, the reason Keanu Reeves left that role is because he thought he was too old. I, 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 I think he's proven himself with the John Wick movies, boys and girls. 
Doesn't matter how old he is, if he can play the role and kick ass. True, true. Yeah, and also check in the info card up there. We talked about Keanu Reeves in the past as well. Check the info card in the corner there. Uh, yeah, so thank you for listening. Worth we'll... over $600 million. Uh... <laughs> thank you for listening and watching this episode of Cinema Royale. <laughs> and remember, click like and subscribe for all that good stuff. Or so help us, we will find you. We know where you are. I have Sorry, you. Sorry, talked away from the microphone. <laughs> we will find you. Yes, uh, subscribe. Plus that, press that like button. Share the people who love Toby Hooper. Show them this. And uh, if you subscribe, please click on the bell icon because that fucking bell icon notifies you when I upload shit. Because apparently it doesn't show up in the subscription feed. And, oh, you gotta be notified by email just to say, oh, this guy uploaded a video. Why not? I don't. Yeah. Comment below if you're in the notification squad. Are you hashtag notification squad? Yeah, go for it. Comment below what other Toby Hooper films you love. What do you like about Toby Hooper in general? Thank you for watching. Good night.